I will start with a recap of our discussions, including our assessment of the outlook for the economy and the judgments we, we made in our, about our interest rate policy and our balance sheet. I will cover the decisions we made today, as well as our ongoing discussions of matters on which we expect to make decisions in coming meetings. My colleagues and I have one overarching goal, to sustain the economic expansion with a strong job market and stable prices for the benefit of the American people. The U.S. economy is in a good place, and we will continue to use our monetary policy tools to help keep it there. The jobs picture continues to be strong, with the unemployment rate near historic lows, and with stronger wage gains. Inflation remains near our 2% goal. We continue to expect that the American economy will grow at a solid pace in 2019, although likely slower than the very strong pace of 2018. We believe that our current policy stance is appropriate at this time. Despite this positive outlook, over the past few months, we have seen some cross-currents and conflicting signals about the outlook. Growth has slowed in some major foreign economies, particularly China and Europe. There is elevated uncertainty around several unresolved government policy issues, including Brexit, ongoing trade negotiations, and the effects from the partial government shutdown in the United States. Financial conditions tightened considerably late in 2018 and remain less supportive of growth than they were earlier in 2018. And while most of the incoming domestic economic data have been solid, some surveys of business and consumer sentiment have moved lower, giving reason for caution. We always emphasize that our policies are data dependent. In other words, as economic conditions and the outlook evolve, we take that new information into account in setting our policies. We are now facing a somewhat contradictory picture of generally strong U.S. macroeconomic performance alongside growing evidence of cross currents. At such times, common sense risk management suggests patiently awaiting greater clarity, an approach that has served policymakers well in the past. With that in mind, I'd like to spell out how the Federal Open Market Committee has been thinking about these issues. At our December meeting, we noted the solid outlook for steady growth, vigorous job creation, and price stability. We also stressed that the extent and timing of any rate increases were uncertain and would depend on incoming data and the evolving outlook. We therefore said that we would be paying close attention to global economic and financial developments and assessing their implications for the economic outlook. Today, the FOMC decided that the cumulative effects of those developments over the last several months warrant a patient wait-and-see approach regarding future policy changes. In particular, our statement today says, in light of global economic and financial developments and muted inflation pressures, the committee will be patient as it determines what future adjustment, adjustments to the target range for the federal funds rate may be appropriate. This change was not driven by a major shift in the baseline outlook for the economy. Like many forecasters, we still see sustained expansion of economic activity, strong labor market conditions, and inflation near 2% as the likeliest case. But the cross currents I mentioned suggest the risk of a less favorable outlook. In addition, the case for raising rates has weakened somewhat. The traditional case for rate increases is to protect the economy from risks that arise when rates are too low for too long, particularly, particularly the risk of too high inflation. Over the past few months, that risk appears to have diminished. Inflation readings have been muted, and the recent drop in oil prices is likely to push headline inflation lower still in coming months. Further, as we noted in our post-meeting statement, while survey-based measures of inflation expectations have been stable, financial market measures of inflation compensation have moved lower. Similarly, the, balance, the risk of financial imbalances appears to have receded as a number of indicators that showed elevated levels of financial risk appetite last fall have moved closer to historical norms. In this environment, we believe we can best support the economy by being patient in evaluating the outlook before making any future adjustment to policy. Let me now turn to balance sheet normalization. Over its past three meetings, the FOMC has held in-depth discussions on the final stages of this process. Today, we made some important progress in clarifying the path forward 
as summarized in the statement regarding monetary policy implementation and balance sheet normalization that we released with today's FOMC statement. The committee made the fundamental decision today to continue indefinitely using our current operating procedure for implementing monetary policy. That is, we will continue to use our administered rates to control the policy rate with an ample supply of reserves so that active management of reserves is not required. This is often called a floor system or an abundant reserve system. Under the current set of operating procedures, as outlined in the implementation note released today, this means that the federal funds rate, our active policy tool, is held within its target range by appropriately setting the Federal Reserve's administered rates of interest on reserves, as well as the offer rate on the overnight reserve reverse repo facility without managing the supply of reserves actively. As the minutes of our recent discussions have indicated, the FOMC strongly believes that this approach provides good control of short-term money market rates in a variety of market conditions and effective transmission of those rates to broader financial conditions. Settling this central question clears the way for the FOMC to address a number of further questions regarding the remaining stages of balance sheet normalization. The decision to retain our current operating procedure means that, after allowing for currency and circulation, the ultimate size of our balance sheet will be driven principally by financial institutions' demand for reserves, plus a buffer, so that fluctuations in reserve demand do not require us to make frequent, sizable market interventions. Estimates of the level of reserve demand are quite uncertain, but we know that this demand in the post-crisis environment is far larger than before. Higher reserve holdings are an important part of the stronger liquidity position that financial institutions must now hold. Moreover, based on surveys and market intelligence, current estimates of reserve demand are considerably higher than estimates of a year or so ago. The implication is that the normalization of the size of the portfolio will be completed sooner and with a larger balance sheet than in previous estimates. In light of these estimates and the substantial progress we've made in reducing reserves, the committee is now evaluating the appropriate timing for the end of balance sheet runoff. This decision will likely be part of a plan for gradually reaching our ultimate balance sheet goals while minimizing risks to achieving our dual mandate objectives and avoiding unnecessary market disruption. We will be finalizing these plans at coming meetings. The process of balance sheet normalization is unprecedented. Throughout this process, we've attempted to lay out our plans well in advance, and we've been willing to make changes as we learn more about the process. The implementation and normalization statement released today is intended to provide some additional clarity regarding the conditions under which we might adjust our plans. The statement makes three points. First, as we've long emphasized, the federal funds rate is our active monetary policy tool. Second, as far as the particular details of normalization are concerned, we will not hesitate to make changes in light of economic and financial developments. This does not mean that we would use the balance sheet as an active tool, but occasional changes could be warranted. Third, we, we repeat a sentence of the normalization principles we adopted in June of 2017. While the federal funds rate would remain our active tool of policy in a wide range of scenarios, we recognize that the economy could again present conditions in which federal funds rate policy is not sufficient. In those cases, the FOMC would be prepared to use its full range of tools, including balance sheet policy. Times of economic uncertainty put a premium on the clarity and predictability of FOMC policy. We are committed to clearly explaining what we are doing and why we're doing it, both regarding the path of rates and also regarding management of the balance sheet. We believe that this transparency is how we can best contribute to macroeconomic stability. <clears throat> 